This video is a brief overview of how to use the Be at Ease Rapid Sequence Induction Checklist. The Be at Ease Checklist is a two-sided document designed to make the process of carrying out an emergency rapid sequence induction safer by reducing error and improving the function of the team carrying out the procedure. Why do we need a checklist? The Royal College of Anaesthetists published a year-long prospective study in March 2011 known as NAP4. At least one in four major airway events reported to NAP4 was from intensive care or the emergency department. The outcome of these events was more likely to lead to permanent harm or death than events in anaesthesia. Rapid sequence induction is a high-stake intervention. By inducing anaesthesia and paralysing a patient, we are removing their ability to self-ventilate. In rapid sequence induction, we are also trying to avoid the risk of the patient aspirating gastric contents, and as such, we do not ventilate the patient between giving the drugs and attempting to intubate them. But, carried out in the theatre environment, it's usually safe. Well, the equipment is already there, or it's easy to get hold of, and it's reliably checked daily. The small team involved usually know each other, and there is time to prepare the patient. They are not usually precipitant RSIs, and in the event of failure, we have the option to wake the patient up. However, out of theatre, this is not often the case. Rapid sequence inductions are often outside daytime hours, carried out by teams who may not have worked together before, with varying levels of experience and in unfamiliar environments. For example, an anaesthetic registrar, new to the hospital, carrying out an intubation in the emergency department rather than in theatre. In addition, those within the team have conflicting responsibilities to a busy recess bay or unit. NAP4 recommended that an intubation checklist should be developed and used for all intubations of critically ill patients and suggested that a checklist might usefully identify the preparation of the patient, the equipment, the drugs and the team. They also suggested that every intensive care unit should have algorithms for the management of intubation, extubation and reintubation, and that national efforts should be made to develop evidence-based algorithms. If a patient is at risk of airway compromise, a plan should be made for them and documented, and the planning should identify primary and backup plans. So what is a checklist? Well, it's a cognitive tool designed to reduce the complexity of certain tasks by standardising processes and reducing variability. They are thought to improve performance and democratise knowledge. Really what they do is reduce cognitive overload. They remind us of the minimum necessary steps and they make these steps explicit. What they don't do is tell you how to do something or replace knowledgeable and competent practitioners. In medical practice, checklists are already used in different environments. For example, the central line insertion checklists that have convincingly reduced infection rates in critical care. Helicopter emergency medical services were early adopters of using checklists in medical practice, probably because of the close relationship between aviation and medicine in these emergency medical services. This is an example of the airway protocol, checklist and team training used by the Greater Sydney Area Helicopter Emergency Service in Australia. It works. Using this triple-pronged approach, they have a first attempt at laryngoscopy success rate of over 97%. So back to the checklist. How do you use it? At the decision to perform an RSI, the team should have a quick brief. The structure of this is not formalised in the checklist, but would usually include why the patient needs intubation and asking the staff involved to get the necessary equipment, using the checklist as an aid memoir. Uh, we're going to have to do an RSI, so we just get a checklist out, go and grab all the kit, and we'll just do a quick run through before we intubate, yeah? Shall I, shall I get the drugs then? Yeah, Tim, do you want to get the drugs, yeah. Scott, if you get the airway kit? Then we'll there will then be a period of time whilst the equipment and drugs are being organised. This time period will depend on how accessible these items are, and can be reduced by having intubation trolleys and drug boxes. During this time, the lead clinician should be optimising the patient, for example, giving a food bolus if necessary, assessing the need for inotropes and positioning the patient. 
They may also use this time to call for further assistance in managing the airway if this is required. If cervical spine precautions are not indicated, then the patient should be positioned in the ear to sternal notch position. This position will give the optimum position for laryngoscopy in all patients, adults, children and in patients who are obese. The external auditory meatus should be in the same horizontal plane as the sternal notch and the patient's face parallel to the ground or ceiling. The clinician should also be determining which are the most suitable induction and paralysing agents to use and deciding what dose of each agent to use. In children, the website crashcall.net can be used to obtain a milligram per kilogram dose and the number of mils of standard concentration that this is. In adults, we would also recommend using a milligram per kilogram calculation to ensure that adequate intubating conditions are present and that the dose used is appropriate for the patient's physiology whilst also providing them with adequate anaesthesia. The difficult airway trolley and defibrillator should also be present or if this is not possible, their location identified. So, when all the equipment is ready, the drugs are drawn up and the patient optimised and senior anaesthetic assistance is present if required, it is time to run through the checklist. The patient should be being pre-oxygenated while the checklist is read out and if everything is ready, running through the checklist should take about three and a half minutes. Anyone can read the checklist out but key to using the checklist effectively is that the team are checking that everything has been done. So looking at the equipment as it's being read out, checking that the suction is working, and looking at the monitoring screen to ensure that there is a catnography waveform. Two working laryngoscopes? Yeah, two. Uh, two ET size 7 and 8 cuffs check? Yeah. Suction? Okay, is it on? Let's check it for me. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Lubricator Joe? Yep, good. Bougie? Yep. Okay, syringe? Yep. So induction drugs. Have we got fire sucks? Uh, yeah, how much of each? Uh, we'll come to that in a second when we yeah. talk about um, the, the drugs and bases. Okay, um, we've got atricurium for afterwards as well? Yep. Sucks. Okay, and we've got emergency drugs? Yeah, on here. Yeah. Okay, and we've got propofol for afterwards. Yep, sir. Cycling? Every three minutes. Okay, we've got an entitled two trace. Yep. Okay, uh, ECG? If it's that, we've got a trace. Yeah. Okay, and SATS? Uh, got a trace. In terms of IV access, where is it? Has it been flushed? Has the airway uh, been assessed? Just positioning wise, I think a pillow is appropriate. Okay, we don't need manual insulin stabilisation, it's not a trauma. Um, these tro choice tips, don't they? Yeah. yeah. In this video example, Whilst they discuss how many milligrams and mils of each drug, they don't actually use the milligram per kilogram format. As already mentioned, this is a very useful way of double checking you are going to give an appropriate, safe dose. We're going to use, we need spio, we need 500 milligrams, which is 20 mils. This is about 90, 100 kilos. We'll give him 150 milligrams of sucks, which is 3 mils. Yep. Um, and have we got some metronol available? Yeah, I've got 10 milligrams of up to 20 mils. Brilliant, okay, and we'll give them some extra curing afterwards. Uh, we've got the German mini jet and atropine available? Yeah, yeah. Fine, and we've got 1% uh, propofol for when he's asleep. Okay, yeah. it's going to be, we're going to use a map 4 blade uh, with a boozy and a size 8 tube initially. In terms of role allocation, the bare minimum of people present is 3. An individual might have several roles, e.g. team leader and intubator. Okay, so I'm going to be the team leader and I'll be the intubator. Um, if we need a second pair of hands, I know the anaesthetist and theatre is free if we need it. Um, Scott, you have to be an uh, airway assistant. Tim, you have cricoids. Yeah, and you can move his arm up for me to give the drugs as well. Yeah, no problem. You happy with that? Yeah. Moving on to the emergency plan. Any anticipated difficulties should have been picked up on airway assessment. If not, this is another prompt to assess the airway. Verbalise the failed ventilation and intubation plan. So this is where you can turn to page 2 of the checklist for a reminder of what plans A to D consist of. We have amended this difficult airway society algorithm slightly, as we think that it is a useful tool to plan a strategy for rapid sequence, but it was not developed for rapid sequence, so plan B may not be appropriate. Additionally, video laryngoscopes are now much more readily available than when this guideline was developed. 
it's really important to note here that this is an aid to planning what you're going to do. What you actually do is up to you and will depend on the patient, their airway assessment and their physiology. So for example, your plan A might actually be to use a videolaryngoscope for your first attempt. Similarly, in a patient at high risk of aspirating, you might decide that plan B is not appropriate, so instead you move directly to plan C. Alternately, you might decide that in a very unwell patient, that it's better to cite a supraglottic airway with perhaps cricoid still in place, or using a second generation supraglottic like an eye gel or a proseal, whilst you quickly prepare for an alternate means of intubating them, e.g. using a fibre optic or video laryngoscope. This algorithm is intended to be used in the planning stage for any patient. However, in the actual event of a can't intubate, can't ventilate situation, you would then move to using the adult or paediatric can't intubate, can't ventilate difficult airway society guidelines, which should be available on your difficult airway trolley. Following the discussion of the emergency plan, what is the plan going to be for post intubation? Patient, check the vent. Do so this morning. Okay, set to 500 mils tidal volume. With the rest rate up to 12. Six at the moment. Let's have a quick look at that. Make sure all the settings are set up all right. Yeah, it's set to 600 to 5. Okay, my time's okay and 100%. That's fine. Okay, sedation connected. Normal well, wings to sleep afterwards? I haven't connected it yet, but I haven't got enough lines for that. I'll do it after. Okay, no worries, fine. We don't need any iron tropes and we can get a chest x ray post intubation. If you have time after stabilising the patient and performing the RSI, we strongly recommend that you try and have a debrief with the team. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns about the checklist, please contact us via the rapidsequencechecklist.com website. Please note that the responsibility for forming a safe rapid sequence rests with the clinicians involved. We hope that you find the checklist makes rapid sequence induction safer and less stressful, but would stress that it should be introduced with team training and ongoing education. Thank you to all of those who've been involved in developing the BOTs checklist, and in particular to Ed, Tim and Scott who feature in the videos, and to Mike and the staff at the University Hospitals of South Manchester's simulation suite.